Welcome everyone. Let's begin our lesson for today by going over the learning goals and success criteria. First, what are we learning? We're learning how to utilize diagnostic assessments to determine your learning gaps and assess what you need to improve, how to recognize all numbers as being part of the number system, to determine which number set within the number system a number belongs, to recognize that numbers can belong to multiple number sets at the same time, to recognize closure of number sets within the number system under mathematical operations, to recognize the relative position of rational numbers on a number line, to compare rational numbers and order them from least to greatest, to find the exact location of a rational number on the real number line, to use the location of irrational numbers in order to find the location of one on the real number line, to convert decimal values, including repeating decimals, to fractions, to convert fraction values to decimals, to formulate logical mathematical arguments in order to prove mathematical principles, to prove the closure of rational numbers under mathematical operations. How are we learning it? Through the NWEA Assessment Part 2 assignment, the reasoning with rational numbers review notes, and the reasoning with rational numbers review assignment. When can we use this information? To improve your mathematics skills by analyzing your existing learning gaps, to perform simple calculations such as a budget by recognizing boundaries of numbers to determine if adding the items in your budget will stay within your income amount, to cut boards into smaller equal pieces in order to create or repair furniture, and to organize thoughts and ideas about any topic in order to provide a valid argument for your thoughts, beliefs, and ideas. How do you know you learned it? By getting a score of 4 on the NWEA Assessment Part 2 assignment and a 4 on the Reasoning with Rational Numbers Review assignment. Now let's take a look at our agenda for today. We will begin by going over the learning goals and success criteria. After that, I'll give you time to complete the NWEA Assessment Part 2 assignment. As we get towards the end of the class, we'll go over how to complete the Reasoning with Rational Numbers review assignment. At the end of class, we'll go back over our learning goals and success criteria while you fill out your before you go. Your homework for tonight is to work on the Reasoning with Rational Numbers review assignment and any incomplete assignments that you may have. Let's take a look at the Reasoning with Rational Numbers review notes. Our notes begin with the learning goals and success criteria. First of all, what is a number line? A number line is a line on which numbers are marked at intervals used to illustrate simple numerical operations. So for instance, here's zero, here's one. This number line in particular is called the real number line because it represents all the real numbers. Now let's talk about location. So the difference between exact location and approximate location. So the exact location of a number on a number line requires a compass and straight edge to find and is in direct proportion to the unit length. So we know exactly where it is. Approximate location on a number line does not require tools and is an estimation. So it would be like saying we're splitting this check and everyone just put in $20. That's approximate. An exact version would be something like, we're splitting this check, everybody owes 1985, or something like that. So that's the difference between the exact location and approximate location. So we're given this unit here, so this is the number line, we have 0 and 1, and we're going to try to plot 1 half on the number line. Well, what we're going to do is, we're going to kind of eyeball this. We are told that we're looking for the approximate location, so it doesn't have to be exact. So it should be somewhere in here. So 1 half is between 0 and 1. So we're going to take that 0 and 1, and we're going to go about halfway through that. So we're going to break that into two equal pieces. Is that exactly equal? I don't know, but it's close. So we're going to go ahead and move our dot to that point here on the number line. So right about there should be 1 half. Is it exactly 1 half? Probably not, but it's pretty close. Now what about one-third? Same thing, we're looking for the approximate location. We should note that one-third is between zero and one. So we're gonna start with zero and one. And then we're gonna break this into three equal pieces because the denominator is three, so we're gonna break it into three equal pieces. So there's my three equal pieces. Are they exactly equal? Maybe not, but close. And then we're going to go ahead and drag our point to that location, which is here. This is one-third. So right there. Now what if the number is bigger than one? So we have five halves. 
Well, again, we're finding the approximate location. We should note that five halves is between two and three because this is really two and a half. So we're gonna copy zero to one out and extend it from one to two and then two to three. So there's the distance. We're gonna copy it over here. So that should be a two. And again, that should be three. So now this is the, between two and three, which is where we said this is. So now we're gonna cut that area between two and three into two equal pieces, so right about there. So that should be about five halves. Again, is it exact? No, but it's a pretty good approximation. Now what if we're asked to plot a negative number on the number line? Well, this is negative three halves. We want the approximate location. We should notice that negative three halves is between negative one and negative two, because this is really negative one and a half. So we're just gonna take this distance from zero to one and copy it towards negative two. So we're gonna copy it over here. That would be negative one, and again would be negative two. So I take that distance and copy it over. Now, here's negative two, here's negative one, so we're about, so we're right, should be right in here somewhere. So we're gonna cut that part into two equal pieces because the denominator is two. So we cut that into two equal pieces, right there. And now we can say that the point should be right about here. That should represent negative three halves. There's a video here that you can watch on how to check positions on a number line using Desmos. Let's talk now about how to check the position of rational numbers on a number line. So first we're gonna to go to desmos.com and we're gonna click on graphing calculator. Now notice it forms a graph here. It's not exactly a number line, but if we look at just the x-axis, that is a number line. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put in our value. So let's say we're trying to check where 3 fourths is on the number line. So we're gonna put 3 fourths comma zero in parentheses. And notice it ends up exactly on the x-axis. And we can see it's close to one right here, but not quite there. So I can label that and check it. Let's say we want to check something else, maybe negative uh, 5 sevenths. So that's what we want to check, and we're going to go ahead and put it in parentheses, comma, zero, and we could check it here and see exactly where it is. So we can check the relative positions of these rational numbers and find their exact locations using this, and we can use this to check our work when we're doing our relative positioning. Now let's talk about the definition of infinite set closure. First of all, what does infinite mean? Infinite means an uncountable number of elements. So it goes on to infinity. It keeps going forever. So an example of this would be like the natural numbers. So we can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and we can keep counting. And no matter what number we stop at, there's always a number past it. So that's an infinite number of elements. Therefore, an infinite set means that we cannot count the number of elements in the set. The opposite of this would be a finite set in which there are a countable number of elements. So let's say I wanted the, the natural numbers between one and 10. Well, that goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and stops, and we can't keep going. So that would be a finite set. So an example, of an infinite set would be the set of integers. So there's no limit to the number of integers we can count. Now closure definition, what does closure mean? Closure under an operation means a set is considered to be closed if when that operation is performed on any two elements within the set, the result is also in the set. Okay, note that this must be true for all elements in the set. If there is even one case where the result falls outside the set, then it is considered to be not closed. Okay, so let's take a look at what this means. So here's an example. We have the set of negative one, zero, and one, and wanna know, is it closed under addition? So what that means is, I'm gonna take each of these elements, so like negative one and one, and when I add them together, I get zero, which is in the set. So that's, that means that the set might be closed. If for some reason though, I end up adding two numbers together and the result is outside the set. So let's say I add something together and I get six. Well, six is not in the set, so therefore it is not closed. 
So an example of what would make the set close would be negative 1 plus 1 equals 0. Because 0 is in the set, it looks like it might be closed. Now, is there an example we can come up with that makes it out of the set? Well, if we add 1 plus 1, because we do need to include it, it plus itself, so 1 plus 1 equals 2, well, 2 is not in the set, therefore the set is not closed. And again, if there's even one example of this, so it doesn't matter that this part ended up inside the set. Because this one example is out of the set, then the whole set is not closed. So now let's take a look at this infinite set here, the set S of integers, and what we want to know is it closed under addition. Now we can't use a table anymore, so we need to think of some examples of addition of integers, and then try to broaden it and say, is there any way that any two integers can be added together and not be an integer? So we do some examples here, and we can see that they're still turning out to be integers. So is there any way we can add two integers together and not get an integer? So is there, if I add any two negative integers, is there any way to get a fraction out of it? Is there any way to get a real number out of it? Is there any way to get uh, a complex number out of it? Well, no, there's not, right? Anytime I add any two whole numbers together, I should get another whole number. So therefore, there is no way to add two integers together without getting another integer, so therefore the set is closed. Now what about this? The set S of integers closed under division. So again, we're going to think of some examples. So we have 2 divided by 1, 1 divided by 2. Notice here though, when we do 1 divided by 2, we get 1 half. Well, 1 half is not an integer, that's a rational number. So therefore, when we do it that way, we know that it's not closed. Now, there's an easier way for us to be able to tell that this set is not closed. Because I told you if last time, if we include 0 in the set, then it is never closed under division because it's undefined. So if we divide something by 0, it will always be undefined. So 0 is an integer. So if we were to divide a set by 0, it would be undefined. So therefore, that previous set would not be closed because of division by zero. Now, what if we said the set of rationals excluding zero is closed under division? Well, again, we're going to think of some examples. So we have one half divided by one fourth is equal to two, and negative one half divided by one third. Remember, really, it's just multiplying by the reciprocal. So is there any way we're going to get something other than a rational number, other than a fraction? Well, we keep thinking of some examples, and when we keep looking, we can see that there is no, no way. And we did exclude zero, so we know that zero is not an issue, so we don't have to worry about dividing by zero. So therefore, we can just look at these examples and continue to come up with more examples, and we can see that the set is actually closed because no matter what, when I divide two fractions by each other, I will always get another fraction. Now, here are the steps for finding the exact locations on a number line. First, we construct a line between the two points and label the points 0 and 1. So we need to know where 0 and 1 are. Then we're going to construct a line through 0 that is a transversal to the first line. So it's not going, it's going to pass through 0 and work upward or downward, either way. Then we're going to use a compass to create equivalent circles on the transversal line. The number of circles should be equal to the denominator of the rational number we are trying to find. And then we're going to connect the point from the center of the last circle to the point labeled 1. And we're going to copy that angle to the center of the circle that matches the numerator of the rational number we are trying to find. Well, what exactly does that mean? Here are some examples of what we're going to be doing. So there's a video here that shows you how to construct a rational number on the number line. Let's take a look now at how to construct rational numbers on the number line. So we're given 0 and 1, and let's say we wanted to construct something that comes between them. Let's try maybe 2 thirds. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the ray tool and construct a ray that goes from zero and extends out somewhere around here. 
Well, we're, and then we're going to break this up, and let's say that the number we're trying to come up with is two-thirds. So first thing we need to do is we need to break this line up, this ray up, into three parts. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to go to where it says circle. So we're going to use the circle tool, and we're going to click here and extend it out. We can go as big or as small as we want, but the bigger it is, the more difficult it is to work with. So let's just go ahead and keep it nice and small, maybe something like that. So there's my first circle. Now I need to copy this circle and use this as my center. So I'm going to do the same thing, but this time I'm going to go to where it says segment. I'm going to click on this point and this point. That'll give me that radius. Now I can use the compass tool to copy it. So I'm going to click on compass. I go to more tools, compass. And I'm going to click on the segment I just created, which is the radius. It gives me a circle. Notice if I place it on this one, it should be the exact same size. And I'm going to do it again. So now there's my there's one point. Then I'm going to do it again. So I'm going to click on this radius. And there we go. There's two points. And again. And there's three points. So now I have one third, two thirds, and three thirds. Now the next step is I'm going to connect three thirds to one because three thirds is equal to one. So I connect those. And I wanted to find where two-thirds was. So all I need to do now is create a parallel line to this one through this point. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to go to where it says More Tools. I'm going to click on Parallel Line. And I want it to be parallel to this line here. So I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to bring it. And I want it to go through this point right here. So I click on that. Notice this line intersects the number line right here at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and put a point. I'm going to click point and put a point right there. And that point should represent exactly two thirds if this is from zero to one. Here is another video that shows you how to construct a rational number on a number line. Let's talk now about how to graph rational numbers on a number line. Let's say that this time we want to find negative two thirds. Well, we know negative two thirds is going to be over on this side over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct two thirds on this side and then copy it over to the other side. So just like before, we're going to start with our ray tool. We're going to click on this point and extend it. Then we're going to break this ray up into three parts and connect the third one to one. So we're going to use our circle tool and go from here to here. And then we need to get this radius so we can copy it. So I'm going to use the segment tool to click on this point and this point. That gives me the radius. Now I can go to more tools, compass, and click on that radius right there. So I clicked on it. And now I have another circle that's exactly the same size. And I'm going to place the center of it right here at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Then I'm going to do it again. So I click on this radius again. Now I have one, two points, and click it again, and then I'm gonna do, now I have a third point. Now I can go ahead and use my segment tool to connect it because it's three thirds. So there we go. Now I can go ahead and use my parallel line tool. So I'm gonna click on more tools, parallel line. I want it to be parallel to this one and to pass through here. So I click on that. Now notice I have a point where the, they intersect right here. That is exactly two thirds, but we wanted negative two thirds. So in order to get negative two thirds, I need to just create a circle that goes from here to here. So I'm gonna use a circle. I want this to be my center and this to be, go out to here so that my radius is two thirds, which means that on the other side, it's also two thirds. So over here, this point should be exactly negative two thirds. And here is one more video that shows you how to construct a rational number on the number line. Let's talk now about how to graph rational numbers on the number line. This time we're gonna take a look at a number that's bigger than one. So let's say we want five fourths. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna use our ray tool and draw a lot, a ray, that goes from zero away from it. And now 
we're going to go ahead and take the bigger number of the of the fraction. So in this case, it was 5 fourths. So 5 is the bigger number. So that's how many circles we're going to draw. So I'm going to use the circle tool and click here. Just something like that. And I need to copy this four more times. So I'm going to go ahead and use the segment tool here and here. That gives me the radius. Now I can copy the circle. So I'm going to go to more tools, compass. I click here. And I'm going to place the, the center of it here. So there's one point. I do it again, two points, again, three points, again, four points, again. Now we have five points. One, two, three, four, five. So now what we need to do is we need to connect four fourths, which is one, two, three, four. So four fourths connects to here. So I'm going to go ahead and use a segment tool to connect this point with this point. And now I need to do a parallel line to this through five, through the fifth one, so because that would be five fourths. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to use more tools, parallel line. I'm going to click on this line here. And now I want to bring it up and place it right here at that point. So now we should notice that we have a parallel line and it crosses the number line right here. And this point here where it crosses should be exactly five fourths. So I'm going to go ahead and put a point right there and that is exactly 5 fourths. Now, what does it mean to find the unit length? Finding the unit length means that we're gonna find where one is. So in this case, we're given where zero is and 3 fifths, and we need to know where one is. So here's a video that shows you how to find the unit length or one on the number line. Let's talk now about how to find a unit length on the real number line. So what we're given here is we're given zero and three fifths and the unit length, another way of saying that is we need to find where one is. So if this is zero and this is three fifths, then one should be out here somewhere. So here's how we do it. We're gonna do it very similar to the way we found our rational numbers on the number line. So we're gonna go ahead and use the ray tool. We're gonna start at zero and go and work away. And we're gonna take the bigger number, which in this case is five, so we're going to cut it into five pieces, so we're going to use the circle tool. Extend it away. So there's my first circle. Now I need to use my segment tool here and here to create the radius. Now I can copy that circle, so I'm going to go to More Tools, Compass. I'm going to click on this segment. This gives me a circle, same size. I'm going to go here to the center. So now I have one point, I do it again, two points, three points, four points, and five points. So there's my fifth point, so this is three fifths. So I'm gonna connect three, the third one, one, two, three, to here. Now if I do a parallel line to that through the fifth one, that should be five fifths. So let's go ahead and do that, so we'll use the parallel line and we want it to be parallel to this segment here. So now it goes exactly the same angle and we want it to go through this point here. Just like that. Now if we notice, this line that we just created crosses the number line right there. So we're gonna go ahead and put a point where they cross and that point right there should be exactly one or five fifths. Here's another video that shows you how to find the length of a unit on the number line. Let's talk now about how to find the unit length on a real number line. So in this case, we're given negative one half and zero, and we're asked to find the unit length, which is one. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna go ahead and find negative one, since we're already on the negative side, so we're gonna go draw it this way. We'll find negative one and then copy it over to the other side. So we'll go ahead and use our ray tool, and we're gonna draw our ray going this direction towards the number that we know. So we start at zero and go this way. Now from there, we're gonna go ahead and draw a circle, and we take the bigger number, which is two, so we're gonna cut this into two parts. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna use a circle tool, something like that. Now we're gonna use our segment tool here to connect these two points and get our radius. Now we're gonna to go to more tools, compass. 
and click on that segment. That gives me a circle that's the same size. And we're going to do that. We have one point now, and we're going to do it again. So we click this segment, connect that. So there we go. So now we're going to go ahead and use the segment tool to connect one half, because this is two parts, so half of that is here. So we're going to connect that to there. And we're going to draw a parallel line over here. And that should give me the exact location of negative one. So we're going to use, go to more tools, and we're going to click on parallel line. I want it to be parallel to this one. And I want it to pass through this one here. So I click on that. And notice I have a point where the two lines intersect right there. That should be ex the exact location of negative one. Now I just need to copy it to the other side. So I'm going to use a circle and go from this point to this point. That gives me a radius of negative one here, or just radius of one, which means that on the other side, the radius is also one. So I'm just gonna put a point where they intersect right there. And this point here should be exactly one. And here is one more video that shows you how to find the length of a unit on the number line. Let's talk now about how to find the unit length on the real number line. So in this case, we're given zero and five thirds and we're expected to find the unit length, which is one. So just like before, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our ray tool and click a point here at zero, go ahead and extend it. Now from there, we're gonna break this up. The bigger number is five, so we're gonna break this up into five circles. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and click on circle tool. And we're gonna extend it and make a circle here. So we have one point there. Now we're going to go ahead and do it again and again, right? So first, before we can copy it, we need to do the segment tool and connect this point with this point. That creates our radius. Then we can use the compass to copy this. So we're going to use the compass tool and click on this. And there, now we have one point. We do it again, two points, again, three points, four points, and five points. So now we can match five thirds with this point here. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna go ahead and use the segment tool to connect this point and this point, because that's five thirds. Now if we draw a parallel line from to this line here, going through one, two, three thirds, that should be exactly one. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. So we're gonna use the parallel line and we want it to be parallel to this one. And we want it to pass through one, two, three right here. And notice now the line we just drew intersects the number line right here. So we're going to go ahead and put a point. That should be exactly one. Now we're given a number line here and it says how many rational numbers exist between two numbers? So how many values can we place between zero and one? Well, we can do like a half, right? That would be one. Then we could cut that in half. That would be a fourth. Then we could cut that in half. That would be an eighth. Then we could cut that in half and it would be a sixteenth. Then we can cut that in half and it would be one thirty-second. Is there any limit to the number of times we can keep cutting that in half? And even at that, we could go one-sixth, one-third, one-twelfth, and so on. So we can do this with any values. And then on the other side, we can go two-thirds, two-sixths, four sixths, five sixths, etc. So if we were to cut it in half and place a point at one half, how many values could we place between zero and one half? This is known as a midpoint strategy where we keep cutting it in half like I just mentioned. What other ways can we use to find rational numbers between two other numbers? Well, we can use any number of ways. What we should come out of this knowing is that there is no limit to the number of rational numbers between two values. So even if I pick two rational numbers, one third and one half, there's still an infinite number of values that come between them. So now who is the greatest of them all? We have three fifths is greater than five sixths. And we need to determine whether that is a true statement or not. So if the denominators are not the same, how can we determine which is the greater rational number? Well, one answer is we could get common denominators. So I could change this to be over 30 and this to be over 30 and then see what our answer is. That's a lot of work. 
but that is a possibility. We can cross multiply. So three times six is 18, so this one's equal to 18. Five times five is 25, so this side is greater. We could also convert to a decimal. So I can change three fifths to a decimal and five sixths to a decimal. I can plot them on the real number line using Desmos. So I could put in zero comma three fifths and zero comma five sixths and see which one's further along. And lastly, I can compare to other rational numbers to determine the distance. So let's say, uh, it, let's try to figure out if these are comparable, if, they're, if one's bigger than one half and the other one's not. Well, then we know that the one that's bigger than one half is the greater number. So those are some examples of what we can do. So common denominators, that's one possible solution. So we have three fifths and five sixths. Well, we can see that our common denominator should be 30, right? Because we multiply this by six over six and this by five over five. And what we end up with is six times three is 18 and five times five is 25. So we get 18 over 30 and 25 over 30. So that's one possibility of what we can do. Now, cross multiplication. Cross multiplication is just like finding the common denominator, except we don't worry about the denominator itself. So we're just gonna multiply three times six and five times five. And we end up with 18 and 25, which we know that 25 is greater. Next, we can convert to a decimal. So we have three divided by five, which is 0 0.6, and five divided by six, which is 0 0.83 repeat, which we can see that this number is greater. Next, we can plot these on the real number line. So if we do that using Desmos, we plot 3 fifths, we should end up with something that looks like this. This is our point for 3 fifths. And then if we do 5 sixths as well, we end up with a point right here, and we can see that this one is greater than this one. Lastly, comparing it to some other rational number. 3 fifths is close to 1 half because 2 fifths is over 5 is equal to 1 half. 5 sixths is not as close to 1 half because 3 sixths is 1 half. And we have 5 sixths, so we're much further away here. So we can see then that 5 sixths must be bigger. So these are different strategies that you can use to compare rational numbers. Now what is a rational number? A rational number is any positive or negative number that can be written as a fraction. Notice that a fraction is considered to have both a numerator and denominator that are integers. So an example of this would be 2 over 3. It can't be 2.5 over 3 or pi over 3. Those would not be considered rational numbers. So it's got to have an integer in the numerator and an integer in the denominator. That's the definition of a rational number. Now what is a proof? A proof is a logical argument that shows that a statement is true. So you'll be given a statement and you will have to decide if that statement is true or not. And if it's true, you have to be able to prove that the statement is true. And to do this, we'll be using a two column proof. So on the left side, we have our statement. And on the right side, we have our reasons. The statement is the claim that we are making. It should always begin with whatever information is given. Then we will continue into the information that we decide based on the given information. So statement is basically what we know. The reason is a mathematical justification for the claim. These have to be proven mathematical theorems or definitions that we know to be true. So we can't just say it's true because we say it is or because we think it is or something like that. It has to be a proven theorem or definition that allows us to state that that is the case. So what does it look like? This is an example of a two column proof. So we have our statements over here. A over B plus C over D are rational numbers. That's a given information. So always we'll begin with our given information, which means the information that they actually tell us. From there, we start coming up with other things. So we can say that this is A over AD over BD plus BC over BD. How do we know that? Well, all we did there was we, to get from here to here, we found common denominators. 
And that's the definition of common denominators, right? That's something that we know to be true. So we use definition of common denominators to be able to add these two rational numbers even though they don't have common denominators already. After that, we have that AD, BC, BD are all integers. So this is an integer, this is an integer, and the denominator is an integer. And the reason we know that is because we've already proven during our last unit that integers are closed under multiplication. So we know that because they're closed under multiplication, then A times D, if as long as these are both integers, the result will still be an integer. Then we can go ahead and group these. We leave the denominator as BD, and then we add AD plus BC. And that's just the addition property of fractions. We know that when we do this, we just add those two numerators together and leave the denominator as it is. Now we know that AD plus BC is an integer. This plus this will be an integer. And we know that because we know that this number and this number will be an integer because of the addition property of fractions. We know that this number and this number will be an integer because we know that integers are closed under addition. So if I add any two integers together, I get another integer. So now if this is an integer up here, the result of up here is an integer and the result of down here is an integer, then it becomes a rational number. So that is just the definition of a rational number because the definition of a rational number, as we stated earlier, was that the numerator is an integer, the denominator is an integer. So notice that every statement has a reason, and every reason is a proven mathematical concept that we've already learned. It's not something that we haven't learned yet. It's everything in there is stuff that we've already learned. And notice that we started with the given information and worked through to the conclusion. So we're going to actually do this proof now. So we're given that two rational numbers, and we're expected to prove that rational numbers are closed under addition. So this should always be how it starts. A over B plus C over D are rational numbers. It should always start that way. Now, the operation may change. If we're doing subtraction, then this would be A over B minus C over D. If we're doing multiplication, it would be A over B times C over D. But no matter what, we start with this. And that's given information, right? We're told that they're rational numbers, so that's given. And all we did was break it down and write them as A over B and C over D. Now we should note that A, B, C, and D are all integers, and we know that because of the definition of a rational number, right? Because these are rational numbers, that means that each of these have to be integers. Now from that, we need to decide how can we actually add these together? How can we add A over B plus C over D? Well, we should notice that they don't have common denominators. This one's B, this one's D, so we need to create common denominators. So we, in order to do that, we need to multiply both the top and bottom here by D and top and bottom here by B. And we should end up with A over D times B over D. And we should end up with AD over BD plus BC over BD. And all we did there was find the common denominator. So that's definition of common denominators. Now from that, we need to be able to recognize that AD, BD, and BC are all integers. And how do we know that they're integers? Well, because we know that integers are closed under multiplication. So that's our reason. So we know that the, this is an integer, this is an integer, and this is an integer. So, so far, even though we change these and have common denominators, we haven't changed the fact that we have rational numbers. We're still adding two rational numbers together. Now, we're going to go ahead and combine the numerators, just like we would with addition of fractions. So we have AD plus BC, and the denominator stays the same, which is BD. And that's just the addition property of fractions, right? We just add, the addition property of fractions says we add the numerators and leave the denominator as is. Now, the question is, is AD plus BC an integer? Well, it is an integer, and we know that because of integer closure under addition. So anytime we add two integers together, we know that we end up with another integer. So we already stated that this was an integer, and this was an integer. We add them together, we get another integer. So that means that this part up here, 
and this part down here are both integers, which means that it's a rational number. And the reason for that is just definition of a rational number. Remember, a rational number definition says that the numerator is an integer, the denominator is an integer. We proved that this is an integer and this is an integer, therefore it is a rational number. Now let's look at an example for multiplication. So we're given that we have two rational numbers and we're expected to prove that rational numbers are closed under multiplication. So we're going to start with a over b times c over d and we're going to state that those are rational numbers and that's given to us. Now we should note that a, b, c, and d are integers and we know that they're integers because we're given that these were rational numbers. So if by definition of rational numbers, that means that the numerator and denominators each have to be integers. So our reason for that would be the definition of a rational number. So now we're going to go ahead and multiply a over b times c over d. And that's given, right? That's what we're told to do is multiply them. Now from that, we're going to go ahead and multiply. We know that by definition, we're going to multiply directly across. So we get a times c and b times d. And that's just the multiplication property of fractions. Now, we need to determine our ac and bd are those integers. Well, we're multiplying an integer times an integer, so we know that by the integer closure, we know that when we multiply two integers together, we always get another integer. So, and that holds true for both the numerator and denominator. So therefore, AC and BD are integers because of integer closure under multiplication. Now from that, we can say that AC over BD is a rational number because of the definition of rational numbers. Because if this is an integer and this is an integer, then the result is a rational number. Here are some theorems and definitions that you'll need to use for your assignment. Given, definition of common denominators, the addition property of fractions, subtraction property of fractions, multiplication property of fractions, the reciprocal property of division, integer closure under addition, integer closure under subtraction, integer closure under multiplication, and definition of a rational number. So everything that you need for your proofs are on this slide. Let's take a look first at fractions. So think of fractions always as division. So therefore, one half is the same thing as one divided by two. So if we wanted to divide this, we would just put it into our calculator and divide one divided by two and we get 0 0.5. We could also use long division to find the decimal value. So we could say one divided by two. So I put this as 1.0 because I know that two can't go into one, so I know I'm gonna have to include a decimal point here. So now I take this and say, what, how many times does two go into 10? Well, it goes into it five times. So this is 0 0.5. So two times five is 10. 10 to minus 10 is zero, so there's no remainder, so it's just 0 0.5. So I can use long division, or I can use a calculator to help me as well. Now, how do we convert from fractions to decimals with repeating decimals? So again, think of, think of fractions as division. So therefore, one-third. That's the same thing as one divided by three. When I put it into my calculator, I get 0 0.3 repeating. Now, we could also use long division to figure this out. So I put this in as one divided by three, and I know that three can't go into one, so I know it's going to be 1.0, so I just add that decimal point. So now, how many times does three go into 10? Well, it goes into it three times. And then three times three is nine, which leaves one as my remainder. Three doesn't go into one, so I bring down another zero. Three goes into 10 three times, which gives me nine again, and then one, remainder and if I notice I keep getting one as a remainder so it just keeps repeating itself so I just keep putting three 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 so therefore I notice that the remainder is always the same therefore it's a repeating decimal so it becomes 0 0.3 repeat 
Now, how do I work with decimals? Okay, think of decimals as fractions over some denomination of 10. For instance, 0 0.5 is the same thing as 5 over 10. Now, for every number after the decimal point, I include a 0. So it's 1 and then 1, 0 because there's one value. So it's 5 over 10, which in this case simplifies to 1 half. So for every one digit that is included after the decimal point, add one zero to the denominator after the one. So there's one number after the decimal point, so I know I'm gonna have one zero. So my denominator would be 10. And then I place this digit over the denominator, so it'd be five over 10. So look at it here, we have 0 0.13 and we're saying that that's the same thing as 13 over 100. So for every number after the decimal point we include that many zeros. So in this case there are two numbers so there's two digits there. Therefore our denominator will contain two zeros after the one so it'll be 100 zero zero, which is 100. Then we place this value over the top so it's 13 over 100. Now what happens if we have repeating decimals? Well, we're gonna, I'm going to tell you right now that therefore 0 0.5 repeat is the same thing as 5 over 9. Now how do we get there? So for every one digit that is included after the decimal point and is repeating, we add 1 9 to the denominator. So in this case, there is one val digit after the decimal point that is repeating. So we're going to include one nine. So it would be five over nine. Now for this one, we have 0 0.03 repeat, which I'm telling you is the same thing as three over 90. Now here's how this works. So for every digit that is repeating, we include a nine. For every digit that's not repeating, we include a zero, right? Just like we did before. So in this case, we have one digit repeating. So we're gonna include a nine. And we have one digit that is not repeating. So therefore, we're gonna include a zero. So it becomes nine and then zero. Then we just keep whatever's here, so that's three, so that becomes three over 90. Now this one here says 0 0.033 repeat. So what this should end up being is 33 over 990. So let's use our rule again. So for every digit that is repeating, we include a nine. For every digit that's not repeating, we include a zero. So in this case, we have two digits repeating. So that should be two nine, so nine nine. And there is one digit that is not repeating, so it should be one zero. So it should be nine ninety. And then we just keep the numerator here. And then we just keep this value here, 33. And that becomes my numerator. So this is 33 over 990. Now we have 0 0.003 repeat, and I'm telling you that that's, the, that that's equal to 3 over 900. So again, for every digit that's repeating, we include a 9. For every digit that's not repeating, we include a 0 at the end. So in this case, we have one digit that's repeating, so we're going to include one 9. And we have two digits that are not repeating, therefore we should have two zeros. So we should end up being 900. Then we just keep whatever the value is. In this case, it's three, so it's three over 900. Now what if this value here, the non-repeating, what if that value is not a zero? So we have 0 0.43 repeat, and I'm telling you that that's the same thing as four over 10 plus three over 90. So we're gonna treat this as being separated from each other. So 0.4 is four over 10, and this is really 
because we've already included this 0.4. So this will be 0 0.03 repeat. So we use our rules here to get 4 over 10 for the first part. And we use our rules for this to get 3 over 90. And then we just add those by finding a common denominator. So if not all the digits are repeating, add 1, 9 for every digit that repeats and 1, 0 for every non-repeating digit, just like here. So that's one digit. So that becomes a 9. This is not repeating. So we end up with 3 over 90 and 4 over 10. If we multiply both top and bottom here by 9, we get 36 over 90. Well, 36 plus 3 is 39. And 90 is just the denominator, so it's 39 over 90. So that's your notes on decimals and fractions. Let's take a look now at the reasoning with rational numbers review assignment. Our assignment begins with our learning goals and success criteria. If we scroll down, we can see some of the questions that are on the review. The first one says, is the set S equals rational numbers closed under addition? Well, we have to decide, is there any way I can add two rational numbers or two fractions together and get something other than a fraction? Well, there is no way to get anything other than a fraction, so we'll go ahead and click yes, it is closed. Now the next one, it says, decide if the statement is true or false. 4 over 7 is greater than 1 half. Well, half of 7 is 3 and a half, and 4 is bigger than that, so yes, this is bigger than a half. So we'll go ahead and click true. So we'll answer each of these questions until we get to the end. Once we get to the end, we'll click next. This will take you to your before you go. Go ahead and fill out your before you go, and then submit your work on Google Classroom.